Hey there everybody, thanks for joining me for another One Man Review. Today I'll be taking a look at the fourth and final volume of Shigeru Mizuki's Showa, A History of Japan. This is pretty much a biography of Mizuki's life couched into a larger narrative that captures the history of Japan in the era that he lived, which was the Showa era, pretty much like World War I, World War II, up through like 1989 when this one ends. Uh, I've read all four of them and been trying to figure out how I'm going to do a review of it because a lot of it is just historical events in Japan and so much of it uh, really gets caught up with the first two world wars and material that Mizuki has printed, pr presented in other ways in other projects like Onward Towards Our Noble Death, his time in the military during World War II, all of that. And we've talked about Mizuki enough on the channel and his kind of tricks and things like that. So I was hesitant about how to do a review of it, but this book in particular um, is really, really nice because it gives me a way to talk about the general project as a whole, but it also is the portion of Mizuki's life where he becomes a mangaka and becomes a famous manga artist and really tracks his career there. That's why you get such a big gap of 53 to 89, where some of the other books take shorter gaps because there's more history-rich detail in them dealing with the wars and things. Um, but you still get a lot of the, the Japanese history in this as well. So I figured this one would be a good one to talk about because it's pretty representative of the successes and failures of the whole project. And then I think really the most interesting of the four books, but also like you need to read the previous three for this one to have its whole weight because it is um, also an autobiography and the potency of the message comes from understanding what all this man has been through. Uh, so you do get a lot of these historical chapters uh, where obviously there there's photo reference being used from famous historical events and you have this character, I always forget his name, but the kind of bad guy friend from the Kitaro series, um, Niz Nizumu, is that? I'm blanking on his name. But uh, he's kind of here narrating the history of Japan sections. And this is where I think like the book both has real, real strength. Um, you know, it's very informative. And as, you know, someone who grew up inside of the American education system and pretty much gets American history and doesn't get details on other countries' histories, there's a ton of really great information in here that just from an educational standpoint, you know, I really learned a lot about the, the nuances of Japanese history, at least as presented by Mizuki. And he seems to be a fairly, like, removed, even though he lived it all, He's perfectly willing to criticize uh, the Japanese government decisions all along, but he's also perfectly willing to criticize, you know, the other countries, America, you know, dealing with all of that dropping of the bomb and those kind of things. Um, he's he's pretty willing to distribute like responsibility on multiple sides of it. So I, I'm not a Japanese historian. This is the most Japanese history I know, but it seems like a pretty accurate uh conveying of the details as they're known of the big events in Japan's history during his lifetime. So I really appreciate that aspect of it. The artwork during these sequences especially is a little strange and back and forth because you have the typical Mizuki thing where he's just doing like the cartoon character and then it's very obvious that other artists' assistants are handling the background and they're done with high levels of photorealism. The problem is, is that depending on the reference photo that they're given uh, and depending on the artist, there's a pretty wide range of styles appearing in the background. So it makes for a pretty uneven visual read. Like you have the cartoon character with these really highly realistic images here. Uh, this one where they're obviously altering a photo and then drawing on top of it like loses the type of beautiful detailed resolution that you're used to in a Mizuki background. Then you get ones where they're really just being lazy and plunking in a photograph or really over adjusted blown out photos so they can't get much detail out of it and they pretty much just present as that. But then you'll get like a typical Mizuki here where the characters are walking around and doesn't have to reference a specific historical image. And you get all of the crazy like little textures and stippling and plant textures and insane drawings of buildings. And it, it's just uneven in that sense where you get an image like this that's all hand drawn in a very familiar style. 
and then you get this, which is like half photograph, half drawn. Um, Mizuki will also oftentimes like plunk a cartoon caricature of a face on top of a real body. In this instance, you have someone else drawing very realistically, and then his cartoon character plugs in, and it's not as strange. But in other instances, like like this, you get a little, that's not even Mizuki drawing, but you get a little bit more cartoony face. Uh, obviously a photo in the background here, but then this is perfectly, you know, drawn all the way through. Um, so it makes for a bit of a, a visually strange read, you know, adjusted photographs. This could have easily been turned into a drawing, even missing some of the details there. Um, so it just, it just, things don't all fit together perfectly well visually. And you have like certain artists that are like the stipple masters and they'll go stipple everything and then someone else will do the same image in uh, cross-hatching, you know, and so that makes it, a lot of it's really nice looking, but it doesn't coagulate visually on the page. And throughout the series, Mizuki kind of suggests that he's lazy, but then you also see him working to the point of exhaustion as a mangaka. Uh, and that just kind of corner cutting shows up, you know, like this is all photographs here. And that that's my biggest problem with the series as a whole. But there's so much material in here and they're trying to convey so much information and they do put in so much work on the backgrounds and images where they can actually see the information in the source materials, you know, but images like this where they obviously have a good clear photo. Um, it's kind of hard to hold it against them. It's just as a director of the studio, it seems like he could have been making more uh, nuanced choices about what goes where. But anyways, that's like my basic criticism of the visual presentation. Everything else is praise. And this, this book is especially interesting because this is where uh, Mizuki becomes a mangaka and it follows that whole history of his career pretty much. And it's really fun to see those scenes where, you know, normally I'm not so into uh, this kind of history of comics thing because I'm like the American scene is pretty well described to me so far. But for the manga industry, it's really interesting because I haven't really got any of that. And so this is a little bit of like inside baseball that's that's kind of fun. Um, you get introduced to a lot of other famous artists that are part of his studio as well, which is really interesting. Um, here you're getting introduced to just the idea of He's giving a sense of like the struggles of a manga artist as well. Like him and a buddy here are thinking about how they could, uh, you know, make the comics sell better. They're thinking about putting paper airplanes in them as like a giveaway or something to try and get more money. I think these scenes are also the most visually successful ones in the book because they really, the backgrounds and the characters fit together well. It seems more consistently Mizuki all the way through. Um... But you also, in these sequences, because they're not telling historical events necessarily, they can really just go photograph places. And so you get the, again, typical Mizuki where you have his rubbery figures uh, it, encased in these very beautifully rendered backgrounds where there aren't being any shortcuts taken. And so this is also, I think, just visually one of the more consistent of the three books. But it's really, really fun to learn about all of these characters. Uh, learn about his career like I'm I know Kataro as like his big hit I didn't know that there was another character that was pretty popular before that named Akuma Kun Arise so I don't know if Drawn and Quarterly is eventually going to go back and reprint some of his earlier work or if they're just being selective about his work uh, but it's really interesting to see that see a guy struggle see him get his kind of first first hit in comics. Along the way, you get some of these just really wildly rendered stippling images and really strange, cool patterns as he's like coming up with his ideas and thinking about his ideas as an artist. There are sequences where he's getting, uh, basically, he's been struggling so much and then someone comes along and is gonna be forming a new magazine called Garo and they're going to be paying him a lot of extra money. So you're getting to see the beginning of the really, really famous like literary comic explosion that happened through Garo in Japan. Uh, we've read a lot of work that had been translated by art, a lot of work by artists that contributed to the ma that magazine that are now being translated 
like the Suge brothers and Mizuki himself. Um, so really big historical moment there for comics as like literature. Uh, long before we ever really mastered that here in the States, they were kind of getting to it. And so that's recorded in here. Um, you get to meet other famous mangaka like Sampai Shirado and learn a little bit about them. Here you get uh, Mizuki going to pick Shirado up from a train station. And he gets there and he's like, well, you know, there's just a homeless person there. That can't be the guy I'm looking for. And indeed it is. Uh, so you get to learn more about other famous artists and their appearance to Mizuki as he meets him and has their first impression. They're mentioning going to uh, events that have Osama Tezuka and Shotaro Ishinomori there. So you're getting to learn about that early manga scene a little bit. You get to meet other famous uh, underground artist from the time as well. His, his friend Yosuharo Suge is here announcing that he's going to quit manga potentially. And Mizuki's like, hey, I love your comics. Like, you know, like, let's not do this. Um, so like the struggles of other people in the scene at the time are present. There's also building a very interesting like personal worldview in this volume where as Mizuki leans into the the study of the yokai, which he's always been interested in, but that are like the main kind of driver of his art um, through the Guitaro series and then later just his, his yokai collections where he's like documenting worldwide. Um, you're, you're getting some of his sense of his worldview and how he believe he really believes these things are real. He's talking about seeing a Kanadama flying through the air, which is a, a type of yokai that if you see one it's like the money is leaving someone else's house and it's going to be coming to your house potentially uh, and then immediately after that like goes home and gets an offer from Kodansha so he has a very mystical worldview there's actually a number of scenes in here where I start to think he might have had either just an overactive imagination or mild schizophrenia where some of the things he's describing seem so conspiratorial uh, but if he's lived them and had that lucky of a life, I could see how he could get that view. Um, he's talking here about creating a lot of other characters, TV boy, Kataro, uh, talking about his career growing, how he's going to have to have like seven assistants now, um, and then is starting to introduce you to some of his assistants. Also talking about the stress of becoming big like he's fought so hard his whole life in these previous three volumes just to get food you know during the world wars all like as a soldier uh escaping getting killed a number of times in world war ii like all this crazy stuff he finally has stability and he's talking about there was a beautiful tree i could see from my window i allowed myself to look at it twice a day that was my only break like manga is that hard and that crushing that he has all this success and he has to deny himself even looking at a tree more than twice a day because the workload's so big. Uh, so it's it really like puts things into perspective. Um, and also he realizes everything he's gone through. He's super lucky to have this job, but he knows how, how brutal it is as well. You're meeting like Ryuchi Ikigami, people like that who go on to become like great, great mangaka on their own, but they're in his studio. And Mizuki gets a chance to tell a couple like of the funnier stories of what's going on in the studio. Like one character that's really, really annoying, blows a smoke in everyone's face, stole people's slippers. Like, so he's throwing some people under the bus. I don't know if he's using accurate names in these sequences, uh, but there's definitely some in inside baseball on some of the assistants as well. At one point, he gets so much burnout that he literally just kind of goes into a coma and sleeps for a week, which is interesting because in doing Strange Death, there's a sequence where Dave talks about Sam Drake kind of on the same grind of 14 hour days, seven days a week, you know, 365 days a year doing illustration work and comic work and Stan Drake going basically comatose for two weeks as well, just from like literal burnout. Um, which again is pretty wild given the things that Mizuki survived <laughs> during his wartime periods that it was comics that really brought him to this point. Also, he's older now. I'm sure that that's part of it. Um, but it's it's really 
you know, it makes, makes one rethink this as like a dream job for sure. Another thing that wouldn't make sense if you haven't read the earlier volumes is Mizuki feels very drawn to uh, New Guinea, which is where he was stationed for a large part of the war on one of these tropical islands. And while he was there, he had really become integrated into a local tribe. He was the one soldier that got went over there and got to know them and enjoyed their food and stuff. And he had promised them that, that he would come back within seven years, but his career takes off and he's struggling. And so he doesn't get back till like 20, 30 years later. But he does eventually like feel the pull of the South, he, he calls it a lot of the time, and goes back and comes back to this tribe tribal living that he feels is so much better and so much more peaceful. He kind of repeatedly dreams about escaping civilization and going to live with these happier people um, that are living a simpler life. And it's it's funny because they all remember him and have almost deified him like in their local lore as this outsider, Paul, they called him. And he's coming in and like they're feeding him potatoes, which he says are the worst tasting potatoes I've ever had. But they thought he liked him because during the war, he was just so happy to be getting food. And now from a place of luxury, he's looking back and being like, God, really? Like, I like that. That stuff was disgusting. But it's really heartening, these scenes. Uh, he's going back and he's meeting like this character, Ibupe, who is, you know, like the beautiful woman in the village that he kind of had a flirtation with. There's another woman, too, that waited for him to return because I guess they had a bit of a, a romance. It's I've been reading these slowly, so some of those details go away. But, like, he's kind of seen how revered he is in the village and getting a, a different look at that kind of life. And just here you go seeing him being involved in in like a, a dance and some of their ceremonial things. Um, and so he really goes in and feels like the joy there. And you're getting, obviously here, you're getting some of these adjusted photographs from when he was actually visiting, he was obviously taking photographs. So a real sweet, deep connection to this one tribe. And then he comes back and here you get someone in his studio has slaved over this insane drawing of the city being built up and and how modernized Japan is becoming compared to when when they start but is also couching in some more of these mystical elements again where he has like these spirits that visit him and have conversations with him um and he's he's dealing with like he believes actual yokai and he's talking about this idea that there's one sold and two sold yokais uh and he buys some kind of insurance certificate that's like a, a trip to the underworld and the, there starts to be these scenes that seem almost hallucinatory in nature and it's hard to tell how much he's just mythologizing his own life and how much he's either on a drug trip or having a breakdown or something but here he gets this this um paper that's supposed to be the deal he made, he's getting this insurance certificate a month later from the deal he made with this mystic or something. Um, and it tells him to swallow the ticket and hope it goes and get in the bath. And so I think he probably got something that was laced with the hallucinogen and he eats the letter and then gets in the hot bath to sweat and has this pretty like visionary experience and describes a little a bit about like his view of nature and the world after that experience. So that that's really interesting. During that time, he's also talking about uh, not being himself for a while. It seems like he mentally checked out. There's a really potent piece of writing right here that says, The pretender slipped into my clothes and lived in my house. No one noticed, not even my wife and children. But as to whether his stolen life brought him happiness, we shall see. So in that psychedelic event, he feels like he got stuck outside of his body. He's explaining that. And he feels like he's off, kind of astrally projected, checked out. And like something else has inhabited his body and is just living his life. Um, I've had an experience like that where I felt like I got trapped outside of my head. I got back in within a couple hours. Uh, but I could imagine that being a pretty distressing state of, it's, you know, psychological dissociation basically due to the stress of his life, it seems like, and this hallucinatory event he had. Uh, so it's like he feels like some spirit came in and took over his body and he's like, you know, have at it. You can deal with all the stress, buddy. I'm going to go live uh, a different life. 
And that that's kind of spoken about here where he says, meanwhile, in the afterlife, and you get this really cool surrealist drawing here, um, he still believes he's like in the underworld. That's beautiful. I didn't think the afterlife would be this amazing. Better than the prison called life. Now you've calmed down. You're starting to see. There's little peace in the physical world. The needs of your body and soul are in constant struggle. You have to find something to make life worthwhile. That's not easy. I thought I could escape my hardship drawing comics, but then comics became what I wanted to escape from. Still, hard as it is, it's a life I want to go on living. Uh, so he's finding peace in this dissociation and then comes back with the realization uh, you know, of how he wants to live his life. Part of that, I think, is now he's made enough money and is in la later part of his years that he can just pursue these more personal projects. He can pursue his project of traveling around the world. He wants to travel the world and see the world and learn about the yokai, the monsters from different uh, different cultures. And so that's a project that he kind of ends his life on, it seems like. And he seems much happier in that state. Uh, you get when you do get some high resolution photographs and his studio artists are cut loose, you get some pretty awesome uh, black and white photorealist drawings. Every now and then they'll still go back into just like adjusting a photograph. But I noticed that the photo reference material in these later parts of this book when you're dealing with politics are typically more fully rendered because the, the you know photography would have been better the reproduction would have been better so he could get a hold of historical photos that had higher resolution for the artist to work with i think is what's happening so that also makes this book the the most visually consistent and appealing of all of them less of the adjusted photographs but still still quite a bit um but there's also throughout that there's still a lot of humor He's talking about this one assistant of his. He's had him for five years, and he's still not even a very good inker. Um, and the guy's just really distracted by girls. And they, they have a really funny, like, again, kind of throwing this guy under the bus conversation here where his assistant comes in and asks him to look at his penis. And he's like, you know, what is this? What the hell is Why is it purple and swollen? And he's like, it's not syphilis, is it? And he's basically asking Mizuki's advice about his dick being swollen and purple. Um, and so just some of these funny like conversations that happen in the studio where they're showing, you know, it's, it is a personal environment. It's not a totally professional environment. These are all artists who care about the same thing. And there is a bunch of uh, kind of shower room talk in there. So these things, these things make it funny and they bring the levity to it. And then he starts really going into this idea of traveling the world and representing the yokai from different countries. And you can see that this is what he really loves, that when they get to the artwork with these, this is where him and his studio are really putting in the most uh, kind of effort of anything they do is drawing the yokai. And so he's, he's obviously like found his real passion there. Um, and, and also, you know, he really believes in these things. He believes he's had encounters with, he, he said, uh, I could sense yokai in my life. It encountered about 20 and had seen one or two. So it seemed like um, as he's nearing the end of his life, he's kind of thinking about what he really wants to do with his time left. There is a very strange piece that's revealing about his personal life uh, towards the end of the book as well where he gets this businessman coming to him and this is in the late 80s and this guy has turned the the sex industry into like a huge business and he's selling Mizuki on like a membership to this basically ring of prostitution and he's telling him like our clients are 100% certified disease free that's guaranteed so they have this whole like system and then they bring him onto this boat like full of a rainbow, the whole rainbow. You can you can pick any girl you want. And uh, Mizuki also like brings his wife in onto this. And like so they seem to go in it together like in an open relationship, which is they they bear they kind of gloss over this section. But it's it's kind of interesting um, the, listening to the two of them talk about it. There's also a very strange part in here where he's talking about uh, being able to put the wife 
into human hibernation and they're like selling her a like basically uh like freezing her and keeping her alive with cryogenics and then they can wake her up 50 years from now which seems to be part of the package he's paying for here so i i didn't quite understand like if this whole thing he just got ripped off and they never actually went and enjoyed all of these prostitutes or what what exactly was going on there that that part seemed a little paranoid and hallucinatory as well but i maybe they really did it but that spurs his desire to go travel the world more uh and then the end of the book really ends with him making this big statement on what he's learned throughout his years in the show era throughout his life that he pretty much lived from the, the start to the end of the show era which was obviously a very uh, convoluted time in Japan's history where they went through the two world wars and then brought about modern Japan as it is, modernized technological Japan. Um, and he ends with this very, very potent like sermon here about life in general and um, not forgetting history, remembering history and not writing over the terrible things that have been done because we need to remember, you know, that we don't do these things again. So very, very powerful ending to what's a massively powerful project that's both very general overview of history and then also by being autobiography couched within that shows how these big events impacted someone's life. So the balance between those two things is really interesting. I think a lot of autobiography is only showing it from the author's standpoint. Uh, showing it from that more removed, like reporterly standpoint, combined with the subjective stuff is really interesting. Not that other people don't do that, but to have it such a clear 50 50 split and they're clearly like, this is the history, this is my life. Um, it, it, it's a structure I really enjoyed. And then beautiful art all throughout, you know, a lot of information about the industry that's interesting to me. So this volume in particular, I really, really love. The other cool thing about this volume is it has some of the color pages that were preceding these materials. And you can see again, Mizuki and his studio at really their full power here when they're doing these colored pieces, you know, they're not cutting any corners on any of this beautiful compositions, amazing rendering, really cool to see them working in color. Uh, like with any other time I see a, a manga artist working with color, I'm very sad that their industry is bound to black and white because I, I could imagine seeing like a whole volume of Mizuki work colored like this, feeling more European in that sense of these finished paintings in every panel. And man, I would really like to read at least one short book by him in his studio where this is what we're seeing. I mean, the black and white stuff is beautiful as well, but like this kind of war comic painting here, like if you could get a book, that even a 48 page book like this of, of Mizuki's account of war with this kind of rendering, uh, again, another war panel here. I think it actually ties his cartoony characters into the background better because you can use the the color to kind of tame down the really kind of cut out, pasted on look. Um, so I just, it's really sad to me that this is like the most we'll ever get probably of a color comic by them is just these opening pages because this is some absolutely insanely gorgeous artwork. I mean, like, Tatlebin and Bissett on, on Swamp Thing got nothing on this type of artwork. Um, just absolutely beautiful and, and magical looking. There's a lot of magic in these and a lot of love. Like you can see here where they're going back to the, the tribe. There's a lot of love in there and a lot of play. So it, it's I really enjoy getting this. It really makes me wish there were more. Uh, but a really great way to cap off a very potent and I think important seminal series that everyone everyone should read. Anytime you get an artist who lives so connected with the history of their country and the history of the medium, like that's a, a must read book in my mind. Mm -hmm.